Okay, I've been asked to uh, <coughs> moderate this and chair this, this panel, so which is going to be divided in two uh, different episodes. The first, in the first one, I will name, I will present all the speakers uh, right now, and then uh, so that we um, get to uh, uh, listen to their presentations. I will appreciate because I've been asked to do uh, to, to monitor very uh, uh, very strictly about time. So you have 15 minutes each of you, and I have to be very very strong about it. So we have uh, uh, first uh, Robin Derby, who is a graduate from this university in the year of uh, 1997, and currently is associate professor at the University of California in Los Angeles. Then we will have uh, Michael um, Gobat, who uh, is uh, currently uh, an associate professor at the University of Iowa, a graduate from this university in the year of 1998. And finally, we will have um, Aldo Antonio Lauria Santiago, who is a graduate from 1992 from this university and is currently a professor and chair of the Department of Latin American and Hispanic Caribbean Studies at Rogers University. Thank you very much all for uh, being here. Please feel, um, should we start in this order? Robin, you go first. And um, remember, you have 15 minutes. Sure, give me a little warning at the end. Yes, you know? don't worry, okay. I will. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I feel very. Um, touched to be, you know, part of this event. W you know, it's, um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, although there's something about being in this room that made me nervous. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and I do think it's in the spirit of Friedrich that I, who, you know, out in the Haitian Dominican frontier should be the first on the roster, but maybe that's appropriate. Um, so what does a Caribbeanist who spent much of her career using oral history to decipher popular understandings of state violence have to do with the work of John Coatsworth and Friedrich Katz? Notwithstanding the fact that I have not conducted a regional history of the Mexican Revolution or studied railroads and development indices, I propose that my work has been even more Im deeply embossed with Katz and Coatsworth paradigms than many in our graduate student cohort. I'll develop this argument by focusing on three central illustria illustrative frameworks. The transformation of the frontier into the border, rethinking the Caudillo paradigm, and the role of U.S. hegemony in shaping the client states of the Caribbean and Central America. I'll elucidate this with reference to my work on popular rumor in the Caribbean, as well as the symbolic economy of domination of the regime of Rafael Trujillo, strongman and state fetish extraordinaire who ruled the Dominican Republic for over three decades. First, I want to elucidate some of the key motifs which I see as characterizing the oeuvre of Katz and Coatsworth. This is, of course, a snapshot since with seven books and over 50 articles to Coatsworth's name alone, and for Katz, of course, we have one of the longest and heaviest tomes <laughs> in Latin American history, this is a very partial summation. John Coetzer's work is characterized by a sharp analytical quality in which he delights in taking a deeply embedded hegemonic assumption and turning it on its head, as he deftly achieved with his deeply incisive article, which has bec become a classic, Obstacles to e Economic Growth in 19th Century Mexico. In this piece, he asks why the Mexican economy fell behind other industrializing nations over the course of the 19th century, rejecting the most frequently postulated variables as spurious and clearly demonstrating that foreign investment paradoxically explained Mexican underdevelopment. If you notice an aroma of André Gunder Frank in the underdevelopment school, minus the overbearing structuralist language, it may not be an accident. Indeed, both Friedrich and John's work is characterized by close attention to political economy, a tendency I dare say perhaps is derived from Marx. Marxism, of, of course, is an analytical paradigm as well as a political stance, and the Catsworth approach is characterized by both. Indeed, Friedrich and John have ex exquisite revolutionary credentials. While teaching in East Germany, Friedrich traveled to Cuba as the official delegation translator, and of course, later had the historic opportunity to meet Trotsky in Mexico. If that doesn't make him a radical, I don't know what could. And John studied at UW-Madison at a time of student protest of historic proportions, a time when hundreds of students were mobilized for civil rights against nuclear power in the Vietnam War and the ROTC. They protest protested in favor of the great bo boycott and the Wisconsin farm workers and against cuts in the state welfare budget. Who gave you that idea? <laughs> <laughs> At a time when SDS mobilized against the draft and thousands of students rioted against the Dow Chemical Campus recruiting and parts of campus were even firebombed after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Indeed, don't be deceived by John Coatsworth's clean cut look. He just keeps his cards close to his chest. Indeed, his wife Pat adopted 
some of the UW-Madison tactics at Regenstein Library when she tried to unionize the library workers and was fired as a result. And John was bold enough to hold an open forum on the Chicago Boys in which their approach to the bleeding of Latin American economies was critically dissected. Thus, an approach which merged scholarship with activism has long been a, mar a hallmark of his pedagogy. A realist attention to hegemonic structures is apparent in his work on Central American client states and the ways in which U.S. geostrategical concerns have forestalled the possibilities for democratic opening in the region. The client state, in his view, became a kind of protection racket, in the words of William Dean Stanley, in which client protection was swapped for military deployment and political economic oversight, a model developed in important ways by his fa fabulous student, Robert Holden, who through thousands of freedom of information um, requests compiled a history of backstage military support and traced its impact on Central Amer American polities. Another key characteristic is a realist a focus on materiality over ideology, a feature which became clear <coughs> in his work on welfare as well as his work on politics, where he honed in on the material determinants of life expectancy, evaluating them in relation to other indices of growth and development. This neo-Marxist attention to political economy reveals a principled desire to focus on issues of poverty and development and the scandalously dark underbelly of liberalism's promise that growth was a natural good, one which necessarily improved the lives of the majority, as well as a focus on the structural preconditions of the indignities of poverty. I share this human rights itch and it deeply informs how I teach Latin American history since I focus on the, US, uh, the role of U.S. foreign policy and human rights abuses in Latin America from the Depression dictators to the Contra War. And indeed, the Cotsworthian Im influence on my teaching may be partly a result of the fact that Steve Mange came kindly gave me his lecture notes from Latin American Civ, which he, in characteristic fashion he had beautifully typed. I had taken the course too, but I couldn't read my handwriting to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to retrieve the kernels of wisdom. Um, I came to graduate school after working for a Democratic t think tank in Washington at the height of the Contra War, which was trying to define an alternative to Reagan's Central American policies. So. Um, uh, Coatsworth's human rights agenda has been deeply resonant for me. Indeed, my first major research project with Richard Turritz used oral history to uncover the patterns of race and labor stratification along the various microeconomic zones at the Haitian-Dominican frontier, a project which used oral history as a tool to tell a story of codependency with Haiti, at odds with the racist historiography of the regime, which wanted to portray the poorest frontier as a hard, hard and fast border, one which in which we used oral history as a tool of insurgency to blow open a historiography written by the Trujillo regime, which portrayed the 1937 Haitian massacre as inevitable and driven by popular sectors and not a state ethnocide. John Coatsworth, as we also know, is not one to koto to power, yet he's also one of the fairest people on earth, a feature wi which became crystal clear at my wedding, when to my great embarrassment, he happened to sit next to the father of one of my close friends growing up, who I learned in Latin American Civ in his lectures was the head of Anaconda Copper, at the time when Salvador Allende, Allende was elected, and thus perforce must have been one of the architects of the coup which ousted him from power. Yet thankfully, no sparks flew, as I feared they might have. John is all apparently incorruptible, as witnessed by his ability to practice Robin Hood tactics in the hollowed corridors of power at Harvard. My own work has tended towards a more microhistorical optic, and in this regard, I've also learned much from Friedrich Katz, who notwithstanding his breadth of knowledge of comparative history, and I recall his comparisons of peasant reb rebels you know, like the Cossacks would be compared to various regional movements in Mexico. Um, and, and he maintain, maintained meticulously close attention to the labor, land tenure, and resultant power dynamics of regional articulations. Perhaps his closest attention to the local had to do with his, his close attention to the local had to do with his training in anthropology and history long before Chicago formed a joint program. His powerful model of the social, political, and economic processes unleashed by the transformation of the northern Mexican frontier into a border and how this demoted the independent free peasantry of Mexi northern Mexico was also one taken up by Ana Alonso and Dan Nugent, who I gra greatly admired, who stretched it to consider how it reshaped gender relations, especially masculinity in Chihuahua. I used this frame in my article um, uh, on that I wrote on the Haitian-Dominican border and pondered how these transformations reshaped notions of race and nation and patterns of stratification there. Similar to Mexico, the U.S. was a part of the story as well since the U.S. had taken over customs houses in 1907 many of which were in the frontier and were a major source of state revenue at the time. And this combined with state formation and gun control had a major impact on regional caudillos, removing the basis of their regional power and causing revolt. What mark did John and Friedrich leave in my study of the Trujillo regime? 
one that explores the regime through the everyday rights such as official beauty contests and rumors of Trujillo's nefarious sorcery, as well as his audacious, audacious tigaraje, which in Dominican parlance is like illicit hustling. Just because it's not a regional history of the Mexican Revolution does not mean that it does not have certain characteristic Catsworth moves. The most obvious might be the fascination with trickster social types. Pancho Villa was beloved as well as despised, and his vanity, duplicity, and recklessness were legion, characteristics which also pertain to the ruthless, ruthless dictator Rafael Trujillo. And like Friedrich in his uh, meticulous attention to local power dynamics and political relations between Villa and his followers, my aim was to move away from the center of power, the great fetish of state that was Trujillo, to consider the political practices which bound the citizenry and the inner circle of sycophants, his cortesanos, to Trujillo. Indeed, I might have even stolen the subtitle of Cotsworth's book, The Clients and the Colossus, to, re to reapply it to the political processes which bound Trujillo's inner court to the dictator, which I consider as a political economy of domination. Rather than others who had counted the political assassinations of the regime as the key motif of state power, I focused on this everyday practices which emerged in my oral histories as the most potent everyday forms of terror, the defiling of social honor through denunciation in the press, for example, where invented allegations such as sexual peccadillos were paraded in the national newspaper and could result in the loss of one's job. I also argued that there was a concrete bureaucratic sociology to denunciation which resulted from Trujillo's creation of a shadow policing infrastructure that created structural conflict with the traditional ser civil service. I, strived to, I strove to explain the cultural logic of features of the regime which had been scoffed at and portrayed as irrational. My approach is, has been that a concept of ideology that connotes false consciousness or superstructure is inadequate since these ideological practices had material consequences. Denunciation could result in the threat of job loss. To forestall this, might one might be forced to recite panegyric or space praise speech to Trujillo, and this in tandem with the exchange of asymmetrical gifts from the dictator bound the citizenry to the regime in very concrete ways. I'm also interested in how the official speech styles such as denunciation were read as populist by the poor majority. Four minutes, okay. Hmm. I better cut a little bit. In my current project, I've returned to the Haitian-Dominican border, a long-standing concern with violence and a fascination with rumor to explore contemporary demonic animal narratives in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, a form of sorcery, or what Tausig calls devil pack tales. These are stories of demonic changelings cows that talk, dogs that meow, and pigs with ki cat's tails. They're expressions of ideology or popular consciousness, but I'm interested in, in those moments when they had a material effect, moments when rumors made history, such as when stories became so insistent that sorcery had transformed in a t in a, an assembling plant in the 1980s into a death trap, where women's blood was found in the toilets and there were suicides, to the extent that the night shift was eventually eliminated since no one would staff it, eventually contributing to the demise of the plant, which eventually moved to Asia. I'm considering these narratives as popular expressions of the emotional regime of neoliberalism for pr proletarianized former proto-peasants as these popular metaphors of state ex extraction came to have immense resonance. In my larger study of these sorcery narratives, I'm also considering how these tales about demonic animals are actually a form of historical memory which corresponds to the real history of animals on the island. For example, these shapeshifter demons that appear as, as dogs, cows, pigs, or trees are often phantasmic apparitions of now extinct species such as mahogany or creole pigs, and thus evince popular desires to return to an earlier epoch when life was far easier for men and subsistence was available through several forms of commons. One could live via monteria, hunting wild swine in the forest, occasionally coming down from the mountains to fell some ebony or mahogany for cash, for example. If these myth mythic beasts correspond to the real history of animals on the island, they're emotionally resonant because they conjure the emotional traces of past events which is especially cl clear in the case of the dog. Dogs can be seen as trauma revenants which conjure up a poetics of predation since trained attack dogs, Irish wolfhounds, the largest canine species, were brought to Hispaniola during the Haitian Revolution to rein in the slaves and were allowed to eat them alive. No wonder dogs are not beloved pets in Haiti or the Dominican Republic and why in Haiti it is said that the Tonton Macoutes could change into dogs to enter homes and eavesdrop on those who were at odds with Duval Duvalier. I'm locating this project at the intersection of the history of emotions and environmental history. One story I want to tell is how these popular narratives evince the changing natural environment of the, of the island. But I'm also attending to issues of performativity and how these tales of poor men vanquishing shapeshifter monsters also reveal a fantasy of power which is virtually unattainable given the lack of available land or living wage in the D Dominican Campo today. 
So these are stories which speak to the past but also to the present since they relate to the evisceration of options for rural men under neoliberalism. So I'm concerned with, I remain concerned with key Catsworthian concerns such as the play between structural constraints of power and the indigni in indignities of po poverty and how individuals have dreamed of and sought out transcendence. It's just that I'm looking for hero heroism in everyday weapons of the week, such as popular storytelling I idioms, avoiding the formal resistance movements which have been the meat and potatoes of Dominican historiography. For example, I, col I collected narratives about the 1979 pig slaughter um, carried out by USAID in which all the wild pigs on his Hispaniola were killed due to fears of swine fever infiltration to the U.S. There was no space for he heroic resistance in this episode of U.S. imperial degradation, depredation, which was carried out under ar army occupation, yet which was so devastating to the small pig farmers of the Haitian-Dominican border since they were the majority. But the tales locals told me of the white replacement pigs, that they were man-eating gringo pigs which even devoured small children and had to be kept chained in the yard, as opposed to the feral swine brought by Columbus which were paradoxically said to be mansa como perritos. One can hear the small voices of history speaking out against power, in the words of Ranaji Guha. And as Coatsworth once said when I was viciously attacked by Adolfo Gili, who claimed that this kind of material is not historical evidence, history is a large tent, and there is room for many approaches and <laughs> scales of analysis, macro and micro, Braudel in the Annals School and Carlo Ginsberg, social science aggregates and individual oral anecdotes. Resistance writ large and writ small, since they all seek to clarify different aspects of lived experience. <laughs> Professor Gobat. Uh, first, thanks to Emilio and Chuck for organizing this. It's very nice to be here with all of you. Um, I thought Robin was going to talk about confessions. Um, at least that's what she promised us to talk about. <laughs> Um, so I thought I'd have to start also with a confession. Um, I should have known better. Uh, both Chuck and Emilio said that there's no such thing as a Chicago school, so I knew that, should have known that Robin was going to throw a wrench in my plans, um, in a good way. Um, and don't worry, the confession I was going to start with is not very dramatic. It was basically that I, when I came here to Chicago to, to study both with John and Friedrich, I was, of all things, a barbarian. And that had a lot to do with my training back in Switzerland, where I was introduced to theories of, uh, was introduced to Max Weber and his theories of bureaucracy and power. And so my idea was I'd come to Chicago and use Weber to write a dissertation on the impact of U.S. intervention in Nicaragua. And I remember that Niels, and Niels is floating around here somewhere, Niels, Niels liked my <laughs> Weberian bent. Um, but I realized very quickly that Weber was not part of the Catsworth universe. It <laughs> uh, wasn't quite clear to me why, and maybe the discussion later on will illuminate that. Um, maybe because Weberians aren't terribly interested in exploring social conflicts. And as we all know, social conflicts are very important for understanding Latin American history. Now, Friedrich was pretty diplomatic about my Weberian tendency. Probably he was not interested in triggering a war, uh, a conflict with me. We're, after all, sort of neighbors. He's Austrian, I'm Swiss. Um, but John made it very clear that he uh, didn't like Weber. And um, in hindsight, it's a bit odd, since when you think about John, he's very, very well known for stressing the key role that institutional environments play in promoting economic development. But I guess when it came to US intervention in Latin America, Weber was out. And so um, I had a bit of a problem. <laughs> and so if Weber's out, who better to replace him than uh, another German? That's Karl Marx. So the irony, I guess, is that here in this very same building, we're on the third floor, uh, the Chicago boys were being trained on en masse. I sort of became a Marxist. And by that I mean um, that I essentially embraced the concept of class to explore the impact of US intervention in Latin America particularly Central America. Now, as we all know, um, the Catsworth School is, stands out for its focus on Mexico. But back then, that was a century ago, or last century, that is, I started here in 1989, many of us were actually interested in US intervention in the Caribbean Basin. And 
as I think Robin or Chuck pointed out, I mean, that was not a coincidence because after all, those were the years when the US government was waging its undeclared war in Central America. Um, and both Friedrich and John had actually examined the impact of US informal imperialism in Porfirio, Mexico. So there was a history here to studying US intervention in Latin America. So how then um, does the Catsworth, Catsworth approach to Latin American history bring questions of class back to the study of US imperialism? Now, as we all know, class is, has long been central to historical work on imperialism. And I imagine that at some point in their career that both Friedrich and John were influenced by earlier theories of imperialism. Um, and I think Robin pointed that out. For example, in the case of Katz, I think uh, he was pretty much influenced by classic Marxist theories that emphasized, uh, that stressed how the so-called new imperialism of the late 19th century was very much driven by capitalist expansion. And you can see this influence clearly, uh, this influence clearly comes across in his first book, the one that came out in East Germany um, in 1964, where he essentially focuses on the interplay between German and Mexican business interests and their governments, as well as on the link between um, imperial rivalries and social revolution. In the case of John, um, I guess after Robin, Robin's speech, uh, I, don't, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, he, he, John got his degree at the university, his PhD at the University of Madison. So I assume uh, he was not only influenced by the, the writing that was going on in Madison, but also by the so-called Wisconsin School, which stressed uh, the key role that economic elites played in driving US imperial expansion at the turn of the 20th century. Now, both of these theories, that is, uh, the classic Marxist approach and, um, and, the w and the Wisconsin School, tended to focus mainly on the imperial centers, that is, on the US and on the European imperial powers, um, and not on those societies that were, sub subjected to, that were subject to imperial rule. Now, clearly, things have changed since then, uh, particularly since about the 1990s. Scholars who work on imperialism are far less US and Euro-centered, as was the case in the past. But I think that most scholars who nowadays work on imperialism tend to emphasize political and cultural factors at the cost of social and economic ones. So basically what we have nowadays is two historiographies of imperialism that often are not, very con often are not connected to each other. Um, that is, on the one hand, you have an older theory of imperialism that focuses on political economy and a newer one that focuses on, on culture. And I don't think that these two historiographies have to be uh, so disconnected. In fact, I think they should be more closely connected. And few make this point better than another Catsworth disciple, um, that's Fernando Coronil, who in um, his preface to the edited volume called Close Encounters of Empire, stressed that scholars of imperialism should not just be looking at political economy and culture, but should try to incorporate both of them into the same analytical framework and then also look at the connections between the two. And I think that's where the concept of class is very helpful because this concept does allow us to sort of bring these two ways of thinking about imperialism into one analytical framework. So let me, since we don't have that much time, let me just make three quick points how I think the Catsworth approach brings class back to the study of US imperialism. And in doing so, I will draw I will mention some examples from my dissertation, which, just to refresh our memories, because it's been a while, at least for me, um, the dissertation explored how the Nicaraguan bourgeoisie was transformed by the US occupation, which lasted from 1912 to 1933. The first point I want to make is how the Catsworth approach stresses the importance of exploring the impact of imperialism on class formation in the countryside, and not just in urban areas, as is often the case with studies of class. Um, in the case of Friedrich, I think this rule of focus is, comes across very clearly in his book on Pancho Villa, which in many ways is not just a biography of Pancho Villa, but also sort of a biography of rural Chihuahua. Um, this focus is also central to John's first book, uh, particularly towards the end, where he 
examines how U.S. economic expansion in Porfirio, Mexico, led to a new concentration of, uh, of land ownership. So I guess I can blame my Catsworth training for having to spend about six months in a hot and windowless property registry building in Muggy Granado just so I could collect enough of land and credit data to sort of examine how the U.S. occupation transformed rural class relations in, in Nicaragua. The conclusion I came to was very different than that made by John and Friedrich for Porfirio Mexico in the sense that the U.S. occupation in Nicaragua did not produce land concentration. On the contrary, the occupation weakened large producers while strengthening small and medium-sized farmers. But even though I came to a very, very different conclusion, it was the Catsworth approach that inspired me to look at the impact of the U.S. occupation on the countryside. Um, and in doing so, the Catsworth approach also taught me the importance of paying close attention to unintended consequences. Because this whole, if you want to use the term, this whole democratizing socioeconomic impact of the U.S. occupation was not at all intended. Um, and I think this, this idea of paying close attention to unintended, unintended consequences is very important for those of us who study imperialism because it's very easy to believe that imperial powers um, can easily reshape uh, weaker societies. So that's the first point. The second point has to deal with how the Catsworth approach also emphasizes the key role that social movements can play in national politics. Friedrich made this very clear to me in my first year when I took a colloquium, his colloquium on peasant movements. Um, the colloquium, of course, focused on Mexico. But the an analytical skills that we learned there were easily transferable to the study of U.S. imperialism. Um, let me give you just another example from Nicaragua, and this time it deals with, it comes from the, it, it focuses on the Civil War of 1912 that led to the U.S. invasion and thus ushered in this lengthy U.S. occupation that would last until 1933. So the Nicaraguan Civil War of 1912 looms large in Central American historiography because, it's because of the role it played in the U.S. occupation. For most scholars, or most scholars who look at this Civil War look at it essentially as nothing more than a political conflict between liberals and conservatives. My Catsworth training, however, led me to look at it more from a social perspective. And in doing so, I realized that this civil war was actually a social revolution led by a multi-class coalition very similar to the one that Friedrich portrays for revolutionary Chihuahua. However, there was a big difference in the sense that in Mexico, the U.S. did little to stymie Madero's revolution, whereas in Nicaragua, the U.S. invasion, of course, blocked the triumph of what can be called a bourgeois revolution. And the outcomes of this failed bourgeois revolution uh, were very critical for Nicaragua. In fact, they would shape um, Nicaraguan politics for decades to come. And uh, this is something I argued in the book, that the origins of the 1979, the triumph of the Sandinista revolution in 1979, cannot really be fully understood unless you look at the long-term consequences of this failed bourgeois revolution of 1912. So the last point I want to make goes back to Fernando Coronel's insistence that we bring political economy and culture into the same analytical framework. And by definition, this framework has to be interdisciplinary. interdisciplinary. Um, and I would say that interdisciplinarity is also a hallmark of the Catsworth approach. Um, in the case of Friedrich, you can see that clearly in his work, for example, in, in his book on Pancha Villa. Um, it's, it's fascinating to see how he considers the issue of masculinity to understand the culture of the former military colonists. And also in his courses, I mean, his courses often appeal to non-historians, and Friedrich also advised a number of graduate students out of, outside of history, particularly anthropology. John's work in teaching, of course, also appealed to non-historians, although here probably thinking more of, speaking more of economists and political scientists, but let's not forget that John did co-edit that book on Mexican images in the United States. So I would say that this cross-disciplinary cross appeal of both John and Friedrich reflects one of, their, one, of their key strengths, um, one of their key strengths as mentors. And this is something that both Emilio and Chuck emphasized, is that they didn't try to impose a specific method. Um, as Emilio pointed out, there is no such thing really as a Chicago school. 
And I, I would argue, I would I agree that both John and Friedrich are extremely open-minded. Well, I guess except when it comes to Max Weber. Um, <laughs> and it was this, it was their open-mindedness that allowed someone like me to blend their more structural approach to class with uh, the more cultural one that I also learned from another professor who greatly influenced me here. Uh, that's Lara Auslander. Um, and it was this more expansive way of looking at class that allowed me to discover the perhaps most paradoxical way in which the U.S. occupation um, shaped class formation in Nicaragua, in the sense that the occupation pushed the wealthiest, the most modern, and the most Americanized elite sector, that is the conservative oligarchy based in Granada, to refashion itself in the very opposite image of itself. That is, in other words, it embraced an identity that sort of celebrated this elite sector as being anti-modern, anti-US, and to use their term as being anti-bourgeois. And this cultural fashioning actually had important political consequences because it gave ideological coherence to the alliance that these conservative oligarchs tried to forge with the region's most radical social revolutionaries, that is, Sandino and his anti-US peasant rebe rebels. And this strange alliance that these conservative oligarchs tr try to forge with the Sandinistas, the original Sandinistas, um, in many ways challenges scholarly wisdom about the nature or about the social basis of revolutionary nationalism in Latin America. And as we all know, the issue of revolutionary nationalism was very central to Friedrich's work. But this strange alliance also fits with John's argument about the role, about the ways in which elites in so-called client states use a range of strategies to defend their interests against US pressure. Now, I could say more, but I think my time is, uh, is basically about up. Um, so let me just say a very two th quick things about their qualities as mentors. And I'm sure this has already been echoed by Chuck and Emilio, and I'm sure others of you will echo it. Um, the first thing is that both John and Friedrich encourage us to think for ourselves and to take risks. They didn't discourage people like me from focusing on places like Nicaragua, where, to put it mildly, the archival situation uh, wasn't the greatest. Um, they also didn't discourage us from focusing on what some people deem to be small countries. On the contrary, I always felt that John and Friedrich reassured us that if you worked in a country where the historiography wasn't large, you could actually think big, because you weren't stepping on a lot of toes. Um, and talking about thinking big, they also always encouraged us to think comparatively. Um, and not just comparatively in geographical terms, but also in chronological terms. And it was neat, in preparation for this uh, event, I started reading some of the older works of both John and Friedrich, and it was interesting to see how they also think uh, comparatively in chronological terms. And I think that skill is very important for those of us who study imperialism, particularly US imperialism, because um, as many of you know, U.S. imperialism is often seen as an exceptionalist phenomenon. The last point I want to make, and I'll make it very quickly, Mauricio, is has to do more with the personal qualities of John and Friedrich. Um, I've been talking for, I think, a bit 15, more than 15 minutes about class. So I think it's more than appropriate that I end by underscoring how both John and Friedrich were a class act. Um, in hindsight, I can see how their goodness, or as Chuck put it out, pointed, their human touch, or to use probably the more appropriate Yiddish and German word in, honor, in Friedrich's honor, their Menschlichkeit, how those kind of qualities are very rare in the ivory tower. And I'm forever grateful for having benefited so much from this very special relationship. Thank you. Professor Santiago, no, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with your technological display. <laughs> Just it, 14 minutes is the, the important one here. Um, so, so, let's see if I can get this thing to count. Um, hi, um, I'm, I'm uh, going to talk in a slightly different mode because I'm not going to, I tried real hard to not talk about my own research. I tried real hard to put myself here. Uh, however many years it was ago, uh, and to talk about what I'm grateful for, what I learned, what made me a historian here. Um, 
with uh, John and Friedrich uh, and, their, and their influence and their generosity. Um, and that's what accounts for the strange title that you might notice in the, uh, in the, the listing. Uh, I, I was already a Marxist when I got here, <laughs> uh, which was a problem. And my experience here had to do with going through the moves that, that our mentors provided, which was not a school, but I think there was a method there. Uh, maybe a, a dialogue between two kind of parts of a yin and yang thing going on between them and how they complemented each other. But I think there, there was a method that we learned that ultimately, for me, had to do with dealing with narrative, dealing with empirical facts. And I put, there's many quotes in my notes here about things, terms and concepts that are in quotes. Uh, I arrived as a historical sociologist and I was interested in the history of capitalism in Latin America. And I was familiar with lots of approaches to theory and, and so forth and debates and I don't know how familiar you might be with people, but m the best I had on the Mexican Revolution with Adolfo Gili's uh, first edition book, not the second edition, uh, Enrique Semo's earlier work, not his later work, and Mar Mauricio um, or Marcelo Camagnani's work. I don't know if those things ring any bells, but it was stuff that was highly theoretical, highly structural. The structures did the work. People just sort of either, they weren't there or they acted it out. Uh, this has to do a little bit with the imperialism piece also. Um, and I f my first quarter, I felt very uncomfortable that suddenly I felt like the rug had been pulled out and narrative was everywhere and I just like, where's explanation, right? The big ideas, and of course I, l I learn, right? Um, Chicago was an interesting place at that period because uh, the we had a lot of dialogues with anthropologists. It was a good time for people doing Latin American anthropology and Latin American history. There was a lot of dialogues. Uh, anthropologists were approaching the archive. We were approaching broader concepts and culture and how do we deal with that. We still want to deal with political economy, but we can't forget about the ideas in people's heads that motivate them to do to think about things that don't exist or whatever, right? The, 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 the cultural piece for some of us that was learning. There was uh, Adam Shaborsky. There was, uh, there was a lot of going on with um, kind of Marxist influence thinking. Yet, I think we had, I think I remember a conversation with Chuck at some point <laughs> about this a million years ago. It's like we go, we learn, but we always come back to this kind of more eclectic, we have to go back to the narrative. Now, I didn't know this, but this was getting me ready to, to face the archive, right? And, I, and if I hadn't gone through that transitioning, I would never have been able to deal with the complexity of an archive in El Salvador, trying to deal with what was a history of over 100 years, initially thinking that I was going to explain the 1932 revolt, when in fact I didn't even get to that in my first book. I ended up just doing a history of the, an agrarian history of the country, very strongly influenced by these, these two uh, mentors. Um, and I guess what they forced me to do uh, was to embrace uh, narrative, embrace political narrative, uh, and in their own, in different ways, right? Um, and find, and I remember this from, from Friedrich, uh, when I defended my dissertation, he said, all you have to do is ask the right questions. You don't have to answer them yet, but the right question. That, it sounds really silly now, right? <laughs> At least it was my learning process, but to get beyond your schemes and move to finding the right question, which can be as simple as a <laughs> sentence, right? was hard, you know, and it in some cases when you're moving the dissertation into a book, it still takes years to, to get there. What is it that I'm trying to answer here? Uh, and sometimes the, the kind of the, the grand theory gets in the way, right? You were too respectful of it. And if there's one thing I learned from these two mentors is to be disrespectful. If there's no proof, it then, then it doesn't work. You got to be able to prove this stuff. And I remember from both of them demolishing politely, <laughs> other people's work and other ideas were, you know, with that basic principle. And um, 
It sounds simplistic, but uh, even when you're faced with the empirical material in an archive and you're assembling a narrative and it goes completely against what you thought had happened, you're fighting with yourself, right? Uh, and they had a way of making it feel uh, like it was a safe process. Yes, you can break, you can break with the entire literature that's been written about this, and even your own thoughts about what was going to be there, right? And 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 you just just you just do it right. So I learned a lot from, and this is where I see the complementarity thing. Um, Katz having a very political centered narrative with an eye towards political economy, uh, asking those, forcing us to ask those questions that were sometimes pitched at an abstract theoretical sounding level just to get our attention, but it really was about. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of these players and these actors and these events and these dates. Um, and none of these other claims can be made without going through those, right? And again, it sounds silly, but it was a major learning process for me. Um, and Coatsworth, I think, kind of had the opposite. He started more with political economy and kind of arrived at politics and narrative. Uh, and I remember in different moments in writing the dissertation and then revising it later, sort of switching from one to the other, you know, uh, th figuring out where I wanted to, to go myself. Uh, is this going to sound more like just the political narrative of these, uh, of these players? Uh, r f always in my head, uh, Friedrich asking me to explain why Pancho Villa and Zapata didn't form a strong alliance. And that was one seminar paper, right? Um, and at the other end, uh, John's ability to kind of go to that Marxist theory and kind of criticize it and moder moderate it and say, you need proof for this, right? Um, so uh, let's see, where am I with time? Six minutes. I'm going I'm to finish early. Um, my, my biggest lessons were to. Um, to stop being afraid, the, the, the there's a certain, in grad school, there's too much respect for the stuff that you read, you know? And I, I learned from the seminars and discussions, but even from watching them listen to and question other people's presentations in, in these rooms, right? That you know, you could do it politely, you can do it uh, nicely, but you basically go to the emperor has no clothes mode pretty, pretty easily, uh, pretty quickly. And um, when I was, let me put it this way, my way of compensating for that, and I overcompensated, of course, was that my dissertation had about 2,000 footnotes. And I think that's a Chicago problem. It's a disease, <laughs> right? I mean, I think it's out there, right? Uh, the, the part of the method is to, is to feel that you got to root this stuff really, really well. And I've read a lot of books from a lot colleagues here, and I think I know what I'm talking about with that thing. <laughs> the archival piece, the proof piece, the you got to know what you're doing with every claim, and their reading of our work went there, right? Uh, so I always felt that th that was a weighty thing to do. It was hard to do, but it was a good thing in the end. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to leave it at that. If you have any questions specifically about my work on El Salvador, I'm more, more than glad to, to answer them. But um, I felt that I didn't really want to want to go there. So thanks. So we're going to open the floor for your discussion. I just want to uh, expand on something Chuck said. So it's a very flexible time. Obviously, questions for the panelists are most welcome, comments on what they said, comments unrelated to their specific uh, issues. In other words, we, we thought we had a, a great opportunity here to get together, and uh, so there's plenty of time designed to be used for this. Let's see where it goes. Um, I also, also do want to tell you that we are recording this for posterity, so um, speak loudly so the camera can, unless you don't want to be remembered for what you said, <laughs> please do, thank you. And uh, Alicia will moderate the discussion.
Uh, <laughs> my complaint is that John and Freeber never told me to stop writing when I was working on my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> they kept asking more questions, and so this dissertation just kept going on and on and on and on. So you graduate students, so sometimes you have to stop writing. Um, so that's my complaint. That's the only comment I have. You never said stop. Uh, so I ended up writing, I think, two dissertations in one. With lots of footnotes. Lots of footnotes. Uh, but I don't know if it was 2,000. I have to check. Can I just ask, a show of hands, how many people in the room are current graduate students? I think those those are the folks that most of us would like to hear from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are your questions? Well, well, I, I, I can make a comment or, uh, as, as, as a sort of outsider, which is to say that uh, I, I didn't go to uh, to graduate school at the University of Chicago because it seemed much too rigorous and had. had too much to do with northern Guatemala, <laughs> and yet I, I got a very, I, I had read the work of the, the professors here, and I got a really strong sense of you as a corporate group when I started to review research grant applications, and inevitably, and, 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 and without my expecting this, the Chicago applications would flow to the top of the pile. I mean, I remember vividly a, a, a set of, of, of research applications in which a, an application by Aldo to study land tenure in El Salvador, you know, by its rigor, by, its, by, by the careful way in which it was constructed, and above all, I think, by the way in which it, it asked the question which, which Coatsworth almost obsessively, but, but almost elegantly insinuates, which is, what's the main point? So what? What's the import, uh, importance of this research? I think that... In, in, in the paradigmatic sense of building habits into people, if I've seen something in you guys collectively, it's been the ability to ask questions, however different your theoretical approaches are or your, or, or your topics are, that are informed, and, and I don't want to say uniquely, but, but certainly specially, by excellent use of heuristics, a very strong sense of, of, of how to move analytically from a clear question to the kind of research that, that, that would answer it. And it's, it's a quality, <coughs> and once again, that, that, that I saw in you before I, I, I really knew all of you personally, which, which I attribute to the workshops, uh, which, which I attribute to things I've seen John Coatsworth do in, 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 in meetings, and of course, which I saw Friedrich doing teaching people. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, I don't know if you even are aware of this consciously, but I've certainly, I, you've been inculcated with that, and, and, and I think you should be grateful and just celebrate it. Well, I think it helps that John would, would I think when I was writing my dissertation prospectus, he, he and the, especially the one that went out to grantors, he, I think he read it 15 times and edited it carefully. So, just saying. We're not entirely <laughs> responsible for the yes. clarity. Yeah, well, actually, um, I got a couple of questions here. First one, it's um, to the panelists and the, the, to the people that work with Frederick. If, uh, what, like, what's your perspective on the future of this school or method of thought, of thinking about some different kind of aspects? Like which kind of methodology is it evolving? If there's new topics that would be interesting to be thought in this place, uh, which countries, in which kind of perspectives? And if there's another new scholar or a new leader that will eventually be leading and can probably not portray in the same way, but in a, in a similar way, the leadership that Fredic had. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a second question, uh, if, if, if I may ask it, it's if you believe that the Kant, um, Kat's intellectual legacy, if it would have an empirical change in the Mexican political structure in further years. So if, if, if the thought is gonna be transformed into any kind of different system in Mexican reality. Thank you. Sorry. I'll pass on the second part. <laughs> <laughs> to take the first part. <laughs> we benefit, I think, at least in my group, that, that the 19th century was kind of wide open, and we were learning from a lot of new stuff, including Friedrich and John's work on, the, on Mexico, and asking similar questions for other countries, seeing that, that what little had been written was not that great. Uh, 
us. So I, maybe that's over. That frontier has been kind of, you know, done in the last 20 some years. There's a lot of new monographs, new, new since then, on, on 19th century Latin America. So in that sense, that's changed. Um, I don't know. Like, like which kind of approaches? Like, okay, the evidence is yeah. always that things have changed. Because reality, social problems, imperialism, the country, the nature of the states have changed. But uh, has the methodology changed as well? And in which ways? And how is that going to be affecting real life scenarios in Mexican or Latin American um, politics or cultural politics? Is the ideas will permeate into the social realities, or is we're just going to be talking about a very nice history of ideas which had no implementation or no uh, direct effect on society? So. That last part is a little hard to uh, yeah. to catch up with, but the first part, I, I just remember, you know, I was thinking of uh, when Aldo was talking. Uh, John told all of us, I thought. Uh, in the year or so bef while we were waiting to go into the field after classwork was done and we were writing up the proposals he always said you should be reading newspapers uh, and that was a little tough when newspapers for, for Latin America weren't nearly as available uh, as they are today and uh, one of you know and that, that was actually I think a problem I had with my research that I was reading the wrong newspaper because it was the one they had the rigs done. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't the dominant newspaper, the most important newspaper at the time. It wasn't actually that, that good uh, a paper. Uh, I should have been reading the other ones, but they didn't exist in the United States at the time. Now, a lot of this stuff has been digitized, and I think if you take the basic technique of first start with the narrative and sort of learn what the narrative is before you go into the analysis, um, digitization, I think, makes it a whole lot easier than I think it was when we were when we were starting out. Could, could I have people to identify themselves and just make it easier for first name basis that way for chatting afterwards? And a lot of us don't know the grad students, or I met some of you last year, but a lot of you don't know who we are. So <laughs> I have a I have oh I think I was kidding. I, was kidding. I, I have a question for well, I thought it was for Robin. It is for Robin, but maybe it's also for the three of you. So. You know, we, we didn't know, I mean, I, so we're talking about broadly, you know, say the 70s and the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. And so it's a question, I mean, I was fascinated to hear Robin, you know, talk about, you know, how she, as a, as a cultural historian, you know, what, her, what your debt to, to your learning here was. I mean, and so in a way, it's a question that I want to ask of all of you, and all of you out there as well. In other words, you know, in the 90s, cultural history, be, you know, so-called, became big in Latin American history, you know? I mean, Yale, it became, you know, very central and to its own prominence. You know, a lot of uh, Wisconsin in a very different way. You know, Chicago was never, shall we say, sort of associated as, with that as being at the forefront of the cutting edge or whatever. And yet, you know, remarkably, if you look around the table, there's a lot of people who, whether or not they call themselves, the name doesn't really matter. Cultural historians really have done, you know, fabulously fine-grained, but also very well-grounded st studies of culture. So, I mean, can you say something more about this? Because the, the idea was that Chicago was what cultural history was not, right? You know, you're talking about Marxism and political economy and, you know, social movements and cats and Pancheria and so on. And meanwhile, the field was going off to ask all the questions. And yet we find 20 years later that, well, maybe, and I, it's a question really, where maybe it wasn't quite like that. That maybe there was a way in which people here, you guys, I mean, you know, were really um, thinking about these questions of culture, but perhaps coming from a different perspective. I just want to throw that out there and, and see what you have to say about it, um, all of you. Well, I, I think the, <coughs> the, uh, the opportunities that Chicago affords for doing interdisciplinary work is really fantastic. It's a lot harder at UCLA, I can tell you. And you know, there, it was a moment of rapprochement between history and anthropology at that time, and you know, when I think of my cohort here, I think, I think of Anna Alonso and Dan Nugent, who were actually anthropologists, but do were, do were doing really fine-grained historical work with Friedrich. And I think of you know Fernando Coronel and Julius Kursky, who were, you know, Fernando never uses the term culture; he always he replaced it with history, which I always thought was a little problematic. But there was a there was a lot of and you know I worked with um, Barney Cohn, who wrote a, the book An Anthropologist Among the Historians, um, and also Raymond Smith, who was um, 
an anthropology. You know, I think it, it was a time when, like, I th when I think of the cohort, I think there was a, a lot of conversations between history and anthropology in ways that were very, very, very fruitful. Um, and I do think that's kind of a hallmark. If I think of, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it, 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 it part, and it's, it's, it's the Catsworth legacy as well. It's sort of, you know, there was a way in which that conversation was going on between us and, 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 and anthropology, <coughs> even though we, there was no formal program. Uh, and the workshop, do you remember? The mm -hmm. workshop was history and anthropology. That's right. Good yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. Very, very good point. Uh, my name is Cristobal. <laughs> and some of those were very um, piquant. I mean, there was also a way in which the cultural history got a little bit battered, of course, in the late 90s, too. You know? But those debates were very, very fruitful ones, don't you think? I mean, I think that, you know, um, there were some, there were some, I just remember, you know, Rafael Sanchez and Carlos Espinosa. You know, be you know, having conversation with Fernando Coronel. I mean, it's like, wow, this was, this was, this was a really impressive place where people were asking some really hard questions about, about these, about how to do ethno history. About, I mean, I just, I remember some most devastating um, kind of critiques of that kind of ethno historical model, which, um, of course, now I'm at Chicago. Uh, I mean, sorry, at UCLA with the Lockhart legacy, and in a way, that was another. You know, issue which was very, but I, I think you know I, I, I think that it was um, I think those conversations were really um, were very fruitful ones, and 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 you know there was a sense in which you know um, it was all right to have those kinds of critical debates even when they got a little bl bloody, but not so much here but over there, which is I did thank my stars that I was not in anthropology in the anthropology program. I I was very happy to be here and not there. <laughs> I think it also explains why what came a little later in terms of the, the cultural debates among historians in uh, Latin America, why I'm, and I remember asking a few people, you know, how come none of, it, none of the people we know are intervening in this? And I think part of it, quietly, is that we had, a, had already done some of that stuff with anthropologists of many different sorts here. And uh, I remember the, the, that famous horror issue, um, and uh, the controversies around larger, perhaps outside of the field, and cultural studies and memory, and uh, I don't remember anybody that studied in here intervening in any of that stuff. Even yeah. even to criticize it or tear it down is sort of like. Um, but you know, partly, uh, you know, come to think of it, because I hadn't really thought about this before. But you know, also the nature of the historians who were, you know, Marshall Solins was using historical materials, as were the Komarovs. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, the, yeah. I think there was a, a rapprochement <coughs> coming mm -hmm. from, from anthropology in a way. They were gearing towards historical topics, or Terry Turner, yeah. you know, who, who has that volume on myth and history. I think it had to do with a peculiar constellation of, of um, anthropologists as well, yeah. who kind of maybe, you know, made that dialogue mm -hmm. a, a natural one, really, you know? Just uh, one simple question for Professor Gubat. I want you to. Uh, to push you a little bit. Uh, of course, we are here honoring John, but I'm sure he's not going to get upset if we put a little bit of action. So, you came here thinking on Beber and you found Marx. <laughs> Is there any criticism? I was forced to find Marx. <laughs> yes, I was forced to find Marx. Fortunately, I, I, I wasn't uh, trained here or educated here, but I had the immense pleasure and, and luck in my life to live here with Frederick for some years, and we have often lunch and we talk about Beber. And one of the things we talk about is, you know, I ask him, Frederick, why, why the Weber that is a, that is a uh, historian of agricultural systems and everything, you never thought? I understand that in America it's not translated. To, uh, that Weber is not translated. But why? The, see, and he always talk, uh, told me, you know, it's very important. It's very interesting because you read uh, how he treats the Polish. His racism was always overcoming his position about, but he's very interesting and everything. And since we already have Paul Gutenberg, who has become our Grecian Cronia Latin Americans, why are not you going to, to defend the Beberian position now in front of John? Uh, why am I not? Are you going to defend the Beberian position? Are you thankful for the conversion? <laughs> 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 I 
didn't realize I was uh, going to church here. Never too late. I didn't put it in conversion terms. You did. He said confession. I said for a redemption. You came as a good barbarian. John. I don't know if I'm. Uh, I feel now a bit like I'm at my comps. <laughs> uh, I was not a very strong Bavarian. I think it had also a lot to do with where social history was going in Europe. Um, I, I'm from Switzerland. Despite my name, I studied in the German part of Switzerland. Um, I did have a strong French influence with the Anhalt-School, uh, which is very structural, which would sort of fit with John and Friedrich's approach to the countryside. The big difference is that they were much more interested in social movements and politics, unlike the Anhalt school but in the German historiography at that time, it's people like Kolka, you know, um, and Niels probably knows this a lot better than I do because Niels was at, at, the, at the University of Bielefeld. But, you know, Weber was very popular in, in the German-speaking uh, system because he dealt, the way in which he dealt with the relationship between institutions and power, and power is obviously very uh, important to people interested in institutions. No, power, yeah. Um, but when I came here, I guess what, what, I, what I realized that was missing about those kind of approaches and what really, um, if you want to use the term, how do you say, I wonder if you're pushing me there, that really got me brainwashed here, was the fact that there were the absence of people, of common people, uh, which I thought was in many ways something I didn't realize when I was studying the Anal School, or using the Anal School, and also the Bavarian approach, because it was much more about institutions. Um, and, um, and that's what I think I got out of here is, um, because going back to your question about the future, I think what really drove us here was ultimately political concerns. Uh, I think that's why we were here. That's why it didn't really matter where we studied anthropology, literature, uh, because Agnes was also here in certain ways in Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. the broad, broader Chicago area, um, Chicago. or history. Um, what, and I think that's also sort of the origins of LASA, right? The Latin American Studies Association. It was interdisciplinary because it brought together people who were interested in common political issues. And um, so and I think that's why I um, have no regrets about um, not being able to fulfill my, they weren't Bavarian dreams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Weberian whatever. Uh, uh, Niels is coming to my rescue. Thank well, <laughs> but let me, let me point out something else because we're talking a lot about anthropologists. There were some political scientists here, and we also had um, very interesting discussions. I think it's also going back, I think it's also very structural. I mean, I had the opportunity to then, you know, I, I spent my first three years here, and then afterwards, that's why I met immediately, I went to Harvard. And one thing that struck me, and one thing I took for granted, because this was the first place I came to in the United States was just how interdisciplinary this place was. We were not at all interdisciplinary boundaries. And I remember there was that workshop at Harvard, political scientists and history, and it was always about disciplinary boundaries. You know, political scientists think this way, they do the thinking, you know, we're the collectors, the garbage collectors, right, of, of data. And um, <laughs> it was amazing. They themselves had a hard time articulating mm -hmm. interesting questions, questions that in many ways are ageless and not always sort of beholden to certain methodological trends. And let me just end by, on a structural note, one thing I noticed, and I didn't realize how important this was, is the coffee shop in Regenstein. I forgot what it was called, Ex Libris or something like that, in the basement. That's, and you could actually bring books down there and drink coffee, and that's where we have these fantastic discussions. And a lot of places don't have that kind of space where you can actually just talk about issues that are basically political issues from an, act, from an intellectual perspective that were, where disciplinary boundaries were not at all an issue. Um, well, Michel's account of his conversion from Weberism to Marxism sounds very authentic uh, because uh, I recall another a uh, conversion experience among another uh, of the, the students here at that time, and, uh, around 89, 90, that was Eric's. Uh, Eric, uh, who together with Jeremy and perhaps also Deborah was one of my TAs in the civilization course the one year that I was here, uh, was getting frustrated 
uh, and was actually thinking of leaving after the MA. And I tried to beseech him, and no, it doesn't make sense. Look, it's so, you, you have such a great possibility. I tried to talk him into going. <laughs> and, and so what happened, the conversion experience for Eric was, he went to talk to John. And after half an hour, he came out, and he was convinced he was going to do the PhD. <laughs> so uh, those kinds of conversion experiences seem to have happened here. But I did want to sort of get back to Michel on, on Riva and Marx. Uh, first of all, so the notion that you can do politics better with Marx than with Weber seems to be very dubious. I mean, if you're talking about classical Marxism, it's as structuralist as Weber, except that Weber offers you a lot more categories to play around with. And I would say, your characterization of the conservative uh, elite in Granada is very Weberian. Because you're differentiating between the market class and a status group. You're, uh, th those guys who are, in terms of market forms, are very much a bourgeoisie in terms of their conservative style, in terms of lifestyle and politics that they have to adopt, that, that is the characteristic of a status group. So you're, you're exactly playing with Weberian uh, kinds of notions in, in the way you're characterizing this group. Let me just add one very quick thing. I mean, yes, <laughs> that's how the studies of class have sort of developed, that there's no longer this strong uh, divide between Bavarians and Marxists. And you know, that idea that consumption is very important was something very much uh, tied to Bavarian approaches. And now, I think anybody who looks at class realizes that production is no longer an issue. It was just when I started, and I associate Bavarianism much more with looking at institutions. And they, you know, remember my, you know that it was, my English, maybe my accent was okay, but you know, it was very dramatic, and maybe there was just a grave misunderstanding. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Paul Gutenberg, and um, uh, as far as I know, I'm not a Bavarian, um, and I never heard John speak for me in his favor. But I just wanted to comment on this question about the interdisciplinary currents that were going on in Chicago. Um, I was here mainly, and I started actually in the late 70s, and I was here mainly in the early 1980s. And it seems to me, and I'm bouncing a little bit off something that um, uh, Warren was talking about, that there were actually two axes of interdisciplinary currents that were going on. One was from anthropology, and I think Warren really um, hit it right on the nail, that a lot of it had to do with personal relationships and people from anthropology who were coming to history mm -hmm. and passionately wanted to study with John and Friedrich, um, in, in a sense, to get move into the archives. And uh, I, I, just, I just want to slightly disagree with, uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's a disagreement, but go off in a different direction from what you said. I think that that engagement with anthropology and all these hypercritical anthropologists who were engaged with um, anthropological theory at that particular moment actually kind of inoculated the historians to the concept of culture. <laughs> so it was no longer, because they were themselves fighting so vigorously about the uses of culture. So when the cultural turn came like a tsunami at other universities, mm -hmm. here people were skeptical, I think, that culture had much use as a concept because they had gotten all these refugees from anthropology. <laughs> it's a different type of interpretation of yours. Now the other side of the coin, which virtually no one here has talked about, I, I, I suppose most of us are enumerant and afraid to um, at this point, is that John brought to the table this question of quantification and cleometric history. And there, there was an implicit alliance with political science and bringing in currents even from economics as close them as the department was here and probably remains. Um, but there's not much, there, there were two very different currents uh, of interdisciplinary thought that were flowing through the halls of social science here and all of us were being introduced to them uh, simultaneously, I think at least during the early 1980s. But, um, I'm not hearing much about the, the, the cleometric or the quantification or, or reductionist approach that was um, also a strong, um, and I'm using reductionist not necessarily in a, in a pejorative term. It was actually you know, an important methodological tool that John brought to the table and the disciplines that he wanted to bring to history brought to the table. 
Go ahead, go ahead. I want to add to some of these discussions, just mention a couple of things. I think, I think part of what, what's being talked about here was circumstantial in part with John, some, some attention by John. By circumstance, I remember orientation here in when I, I started here in 1985, and they explained everything. Was, someone joked to me, take advantage, because the only free meals you get from Chicago, they had free hamburgers out there for three nights in a row. And, then the next week, the, the, the fees started adding up. But anyway, and I remember they explained the system. Was some ministry department said, you need three people for your exams. You need three people for this. You need three people. And we kept talking about John and Friedrich and John and Friedrich. And I asked me, what do you do? And you hustle. You, in a sense, you, you find other people to work with. And I think that was part. It's almost, again, circumstantial in a sense. I was fortunate to have Neil was here nearby. He was, he was a great Peruvianist. And Bernard Cohen, again, all the people we mentioned, political science. I, Part of that, and they were fine with that. They liked that, the fact that we sort of made that engagement. I asked a couple, I came very enthused about certain trends in social history, and I ran it by a couple non Latin Americanists, and they basically said, Nice talk to me, we're not interested. Um, they weren't particularly friendly. Um, but then we were forced to go, go out and meet. But coming back to the, the comment, the, the question that from a graduate student about um, waves and trends, one thing that John, is, I think, had. Uh, one characteristic, and you can certainly correct me, John, because you're five feet away from me and I'm talking about you. Um, he never liked niche building. In other words, historians always, and I see this in my students, fall into no one has studied this. Or, or uh, the historiography's moved this way and this way, but no one's done this for this time period and this area. And that was particularly true as social history moved towards cultural history. Nobody's done this group in this area in that year. And his first response is, so what? Who cares? What are you contributing? Why does this matter politically, theoretically, etc.? And I always remember that response forced a lot of us, whether those dabbling in quantitative history, those who'd already made the cultural turn, linguistics, not all these different fields, why does this broader issue matter? And I remember that resonating with many of us, many of us going home sort of having been stung with this, you know, so what? No one studied that for proof. There's no broader reasons. Maybe that's good. So that's just, that's just a comment, if you will. Yeah. I remember your uh, second part of your question is um, in what ways has the legacy of the Catsworth years affected uh, current Mexican pol politics and you know, not just Mexican but all over Latin America um, I it's it's very difficult to say of, of now I mean I, I'm not even in college yet so I have no authority on this whatsoever but I, as I remember him telling me um, what he tried to do with his Pancho Villa book, and what I'm not as familiar, sadly, with John's work, but I hope to be one day. What um, John and Friedrich together tried to do is bring these figures that are very misunderstood as, and not just amongst outsiders, but amongst their own people, to light, and in a fair and fair and balanced way that could really help bring together a scarred country in a way. The Mexican Revolution was you know, devastating for Mexico, and as and Pancho Villa is one of the major figures of that. He, without, without a major, really unbiased book about him, there could be no discussion on it. And with this book, he hoped to sort of help some of that, relieve some of that tension and bridge some of these, some, some of the gaps in Mexican society to bring about a discussion on this. And from what I can tell, from what I've heard, it has been successful in a way. So I can't tell you uh, I don't. I don't know about what ha what it's done on actual policy, but socially, I think it has brought upon a new discussion on, it, which is important. See, she didn't identify him himself. I will. So you know, this is Benjamin Ross, is Friedrich's grandson. He's in high school now. He wants to be a historian. He's already a damn good one. So. <laughs> <laughs> can I just? Can I? Just someone else. Can I follow up on what you said and also your question and um, Emilio's question? I think. In addition to the whole, you know, sort of great place for interdisciplinarity, I think because of, of John and Friedrich, this was also a place in which exchange with Latin America was crucial to what we were doing and to what the program was all about. Both of them were people who were deeply involved with Mexico and with Mexican historians. Because of the Tinker program, many people were always coming up here. So we were part of a much larger um, universe and dialogue. And, and I think that explains in some ways, too, some of the, the sort of other kinds of ways in which we were thinking because, you know, theory and, and ideas didn't just get produced in the North. Um, I think that was a really important part, and all of you who are Mauricio, Dane, and, and Emilio continue that tradition. I'd like to, yeah, I'd actually like to 
that was exactly what I was going to say. I, I uh, had the advantage of coming back to Chicago after uh, four years after having graduated. I never thought I'd be back here, um, and it was it was uh, Im immensely fulfilling to get a chance to uh, meet Friedrich now as a, as my senior colleague, um, and not as so much as a student. And one of the advantages I had was I, I interviewed him for a, a news. Um, flyer for the social sciences at one point, and I asked him what what he what I thought what he thought had made Chicago um, unlike other places, and in some ways it was. And and his response was precisely that uh, that it was uh, the emphasis on knowing the historiographies and the historians and the debates of the places that we studied. That uh, that he continually emphasized, yeah. um, and I thought that that that, that intermixture, and, and I can I can tell you uh, as an outsider, but who gets to uh, to watch the fishbowl of the U of C from a little bit further north, um, that it, that that tradition really does continue, um, and I think that it's actually quite telling that we have our panelists here uh, are people who study uh, Central America and the Caribbean at a time when Central America and the Caribbean were very much under the thumb of the United States and under U.S. imperialism. So we're studying these questions historically, but we're trying to find answers to them. And, and in Robin's case, uh, you know, now the question begins to become increasingly one of environment uh, in which we're also trying to attend to the issues that, that are alive within the areas we study so that it's not just an ivory tower, but we try to make uh, some real links with the issues, uh, even if historically, that, that, we, that we've worked on. Just to start with you, first of all, to confirm Niels is uh, converging to Arizona. And I appreciate you hearing from the other side. And yes, I do blame John for sucking me into the vortex of academia and <laughs> ever since. But um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is, at least for my cohort, our cohort was uh, the role of Caspic, which I assume John had a key role in uh, organizing. This was this maybe three or five year grant from the MacArthur Foundation, as I understood it, which uh, was the Council for Advanced Studies in Peace and International Cooperation. And it explicitly set up this uh, framework at this moment of the transition away from the Cold War to merge area studies with international relations. And for me, at least, um, I remember it was just a fascinating, there was a series of year long courses that were taught, and they must have brought in through money uh, outside uh, uh, folks to come and do uh, you know, guest lectures and so forth. And it just put together in the classroom uh, the, you know, historians with anthropologists, with international relations people, and forced this kind of dialogue or such, or left us to try to figure it out. And I just remember thinking at the time how it helped to legitimize um, a framework for merging uh, mergings of the social sciences, right? Um, uh, the anthropology and, and history and, and international relations. And then to sort of, in that respect, to echo, I don't know if Robin said this or Misha or someone, that um, it wasn't just the dialogue with the anthropology, which is absolutely true in the way that Robin and others have pointed out. And I think Paul's point about the inoculation is, is, is true, actually. There's, there's definitely something to that. Um, but also is the dialogue with the political scientists and the international relations folks, the whole IR school here at Chicago, uh, which Caspic, at least for my experience, helped to uh, you know, mobilize or something. Um, I was doing an IR, MA in IR in any event, so I was exposed to that already. But I remember these incredibly fierce discussions going on, and this is really what Chris was saying, when uh, the Colliers came to visit, David Collier, um, and they were working out their book, and this was the moment of, you know, the final offensive in El Salvador and what was going on in Central America, and there was just unbelievable, I mean, people were going at each other uh, uh, over these issues and trying to figure out what was the place of this sort of historical view <laughs> versus the activist view and, and, the, and the political science view. And so for me, at least, I found that those debates were as important as what was going on, you know, on the other side of campus, the, the IR side and the other side. And history was the nicely situated uh, in the middle, as it were. Can I say something? Uh, this is all bringing stuff back. <laughs> I have to admit that. What was going on in Central America was so important for all of us that it is kind of a very special period. You know, the, the I was getting ready to go do my field work there, my archival work, and the final offensive broke out. And, you know, 
El Salvador. I had to postpone it for a month or whatever. Uh, so, and you kind of forget that, how we were all involved, uh, many of us were involved with the Central America Solidarity Committee here, selling Nicaraguan coffee. I remember when the United States yeah. invaded Panama, and we all got together with yeah. Peter, yeah. and we were watching, and, and what's his case, uh, uh, Tom Jelton was mm -hmm. here in residency right here, yeah. and uh, I remember we all gathered at someone's house, and we're kind of watching the news, and figure out what was going on. Yeah, and I don't think we had illusions that, you know, our academic work, our careers, getting the PhD was political work per se, but there was a lot of politics going on anyway. And it really mattered, I guess, uh, to make all of this stuff kind of feel feel important in a way, even maybe it wasn't, you know, whatever. The, the, I wanted to add on the quantitative thing, I remember making the point in my dissertation of taking a note of everything quantifiable. I said, I'm not gonna go hardcore on this, but I wanted to impress the, the, the maestros, and I'm gonna make tables of all this stuff. And maybe even do, I remember being told to do in, indices, and rather than just the numbers, I gotta have the index to see what the, the numbers really mean, right? That, that's as far as I got, no correlations or anything. That was in the proposal, but that was dropped. Uh, but I remember when it came to production, land, anything I could n number, and of course, besides the hundreds and hundreds of footnotes that, that had a lot of tables. So I'm not sure what I did with that in the end, but uh, there it was. I'd like to raise another political point. Uh, Richard Grossman. Uh, I went down, I, I came here because I, I was at the chair of the Nicaragua Solidarity Committee in Chicago. So I came because I was politically active to come back to school because I figured what do I do to help Nicaragua but to do research to help them. Uh, and I was down there for my research when the Sandinistas lost the election in 1990. And I said, ah, shit, there goes all my research possibilities because everything closed down and there was very few archives to start off with. Uh, but then coming back and forth, uh, I uncovered in Washington and the U.S. National Archives lots of documents that the Nicaraguans had never seen, including letters from Sandino that had never been published down there. And so um, John, among others, allowed me to like photocopy lots of material to bring down to Nicaragua to give them copies of my material. Uh, also donated uh, office supplies because Nicaragua in 1990 to get a stapler, you know, was like almost impossible. So the fact that, again, going beyond just the academic stuff, uh, John was very supportive in the political work also, uh, and Friedrich, uh, you know, I, thousands of pages of U.S. documents I photocopied and, and brought down there, and I don't know how many suitcases full of pencils and staplers and stuff. Um, so it's also, I mean, that was a great contribution. So while I complained on my first statement about you never telling me to stop, uh, I, I thank you for all the other support. Uh, I'm Jeremy Vasquez. Um, I guess I would like to suggest the following. I have, I've never read Weber, I admit, and I don't think I'm a Marxist, and I'm definitely not a cultural historian. I do like to do quantifiable things. I love regression analysis, et cetera, but I actually think that may have been what was so great about this place, is that there may have been a school, but we all did what we loved and we pursued what we passionately felt about, and I think that really made us unique. When I think about many of my colleagues from other schools who came out, about the same time, Wisconsin, UCLA, Yale, they all had very similar interests and they did very similar things. In many ways they were produced or they were clones, not to insult, of their mentors. Instead, our mentors encouraged us to do what we loved and I think that's what made us unique. We, we explored everything under the sun from cultural to economic to political to anthropological to cultural. I think I said that twice and that's what made us kind of unique and maybe makes us stand out. Yes. yes, my name is Friedrich Schuler. I also recently discovered two new documents. I can share them with you later. Uh, I want to thank John because like this gentleman said before me, these two people were amazing because what I learned from John is not to apologize for what I do. And uh, I like, you know, and you, and also, I mean, I, I learn more and more. I'm still immigrating to this country after 33 years. Um, both 
sincerely and honestly were totally open, cosmopolitan, how they dealt with somebody from somewhere totally different. Imagine I'm a German guy to come to America to teach about Mexico. There are not many of those. As Niels, I don't know, he's Peru. Yes. <laughs> so it's two, you know, let's count. <laughs> <That's a few. laughs> so um, splendid for genuine human openness and support regardless of where one stood. And that's really rare. So thank you.